I always like at these things to try to get everybody back together at the end and see if we can put any pieces together that uh, maybe we uh, didn't think of earlier or you thought of questions later on. This would be the time to ask. How come you didn't tell us about this beforehand? Because <laughs> I didn't want you weaseling out and escaping on me. That would be terrible. That's a question. I thought you were putting farmers up here so we could grill well, the farmers. Um, <laughs> on your, on the gypsum, what yes. are you, any rates that you're, maximum rates at any one time or, or maximum rates on climbing? What's your thoughts there at any one time? Did everybody hear the question? Rates on gypsum and liming and that. Um, I guess the first thing you would look at is your, you know, your CEC, how heavy or light is your soil. Does everybody understand cation exchange capacity in your soils? All right, so we'll just give you a brief hope. Did somebody say no? Right. Okay, so when you look at your soil test and you have a CEC, that number can range anywhere from well, basically one up to 50. So it's a real easy way to, to understand your soils. The lower the number, the lighter or sandier your soil. So a sandy soil could have a CEC from five to nine. Really, really light soils might get down in three or four. Those are, those are an oddity. That's how we're getting right, trying to plant out on the beach here. You get into heavy soils, like up in the Red River Valley in Minnesota, they'll have CCs of 40. So it's the holding capacity of your soil. I don't know, so help me out here. What's CCs in this area? And maybe there's ranges. If you're above 10, actually, you're pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so we're in, these are lighter soils than that yep. you're dealing with. Bob, what I tell people is we got three kinds of soil. We got too much clay, too much sand, and too much water. That's your choices around here. Not necessarily mutually exclusive. Okay, all right. So, looking now back to your question, so if you look at that lighter, sandier soil, it's going to take less pounds of gypsum or lime to change the nutrient analysis or the base or calcium. So, a ton of lime on a light sandy soil with a CEC of 7 is going to change the pH, going to raise your pH a lot faster than a ton of lime on a CEC of 20. Does that make sense to everybody? just heavier soils, it takes more product. So just a couple of general things to answer your question. Normally, um, I don't like extremes, so if I get my soil test back and it calls for five ton of lime, I might be more apt to, I like to lay out soil corrections for three years, so I might put two ton of lime on for two years and then let the soil then farm it one more year and then soil sample. So kind of go go slow, I guess is maybe the message there. But once again, you know, your CEC comes into that question. As far as gypsum goes, does everybody understand that? This is going to be a long answer. <laughs> does everybody understand the difference between lime and gypsum? Gypsum is appropriately named because it gypsum. Right? All right. Lime is normally a calcium percentage of say 25 to 35 percent calcium and then if it's dolomitic lime it might have a percent magnesium in it maybe from 10 to 15 percent magnesium. Normally people that are buying or looking for what, would, what they call high calcium lime your magnesium content is less than 2 percent. Calcium should be around 30. Gypsum is a calcium sulfate, so it's calcium and sulfur. So it's 20 to 21 percent calcium, 17 to 18 percent sulfur. So it's almost a one-to-one -one calcium to sulfur. So if you have low pH and low calcium levels, you're going to want to line it first. But if you're looking at opening your soils, heavier, heavy clay soils, higher magnesium soils, gypsum. <coughs> flocculate soil colloid. So think of your soils are like a sponge. So if you had a 70% calcium, 15% magnesium, that's a brand new sponge you just took out of a package. 30% magnesium, 55% calcium, you just compress the sponge. You lost your air and water holding capacity. Gypsum opens that back up. So now as far as rates, the first thing if, if we got uh, lighter soils here, What's the magnesium levels in the soils? 
usually not too bad. That's, it doesn't tend to be as out of whack. I, I think largely because there's not a lot of dolomite around, so guys aren't buying dolomite they, unless they really need it. But could they be on the low side? Do you know Jake? Did. I didn't introduce Jake, by the way. Jake is with Advanced Ag Services. They're at uh, Grand Rapids. Yep. Yeah, Grand Rapids area. We have a working relationship with them. They're like dealers or associates for us, and then one couple of our liquid products that we have manufactured is also through them. So they're our representative in the area here, and I forgot to introduce them when we came up here this morning. So um, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. So I Jake, do you know in the um, do, is there is there does anybody know? Do you have low? Are, are you magnesium levels down below twelve percent? Very low. <laughs> Okay, so if you're in the 14, 16 percent, that's not bad. But when you get into lighter soils, you have to be careful applying too much gypsum because you don't want to lower your magnesium levels. See, as your soils, as your soils get lighter, and your magnesium level goes down and gets down below that 14. Then your soils, you have trouble holding nitrogen and potassium because now it can, the water just washes it right through there. You'd want to see those magnesium levels probably closer to 16 or 18 to give it some holding capacity. So now you want to go slow with your gypsum go out there and you wouldn't want to put a ton of gypsum on those type of soils because that excess sulfur could possibly flush out some more magnesium and then you'll lose some of your holding capacity. Can you talk a little bit about hydrated sphere of these cations? Because I think that <coughs> helps you explain that water holding capacity a little bit. What's that? Say that again, Mark. Just the, the ability of magnesium to hold water molecules as compared to calcium. And I think that that helps me understand what's really going on at that yeah. molecular level. Mm -hmm. Well, even if you just look at, just let's go back, let's just use the sponge theory. All right, so as our magnesium level gets slow, now we've taken that sponge and we've just opened it up even more. We've got all this big porous space in there so everything can just move right through it. So that's that's the salt balancing part that you keep that at, you know, 70% calcium around 15% magnesium. And probably more magnesium on a lighter soil and, and lower on magnesium on a lighter soil. Mm -hmm. So did that answer your question? How, is anybody in here using gypsum? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. And at what rates? Thousand pounds. Okay. I would just watch my magnesium levels. Now, you had a question earlier about high magnesium and lowering that. So he was asking me, he said he had some 30% magnesiums. How do you lower those in your soils? Depending upon how heavy or light your soil is, that can take a period of years. That doesn't happen in one year. But the thumb rule on that is if you have high magnesium and you want to lower it, your base saturation of calcium needs to be above 65%. Because you have to have additional calcium out there to displace that magnesium. I've been involved with farms and they said, well, I've got high magnesium, so I'm putting all this sulfur on. And a little bit of sulfur is fine, but I've run into some farms that are up to four and five hundred pounds of ammonium sulfate and I said why are you doing that much so I'm trying to get rid of my magnesium but their base saturation of calcium at 60 percent it's not going to happen you got to bring some calcium on with the sulfur so don't make that mistake okay so now I'm going to defer the question you want to add anything thank okay. <laughs> you I understand better now okay <laughs> Yes. I had a producer tell me they, they have high phosphorus soils over 300 pounds per acre and they, their consultant or ag, the agronomist told them that there's a potential that to, to get these higher yields that they're going to have to continue to add more phosphorus to that soil and, and what he was telling me is, is because of it's tied up in the soil as it is. So I mean it, it just very interesting that there's all this phosphorus in there and they potentially have to add more to achieve higher yields. Is there a way to unlock that or is there a different approach? I mean, especially in this watershed where we already have extremely high pea soils, um, we need to try to lower that. Um, is there any comment on that? Can I answer that? <laughs> yes. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, first off, we have to make sure that we're that our that the terminology of what we're talking to adding additional phosphorus to that. I mean, I don't want to disagree with anybody or you know criticize here, but to me that would be a terrible mistake. Now, what I've seen and what we see in our area because we have all this hog manure on a lot of farms and their phosphorus levels get high, the industry wants to sell them more potassium and they tell them they need to balance that out. And that's not necessarily the right thing for our soils either. My experience has been that high phosphorus, we had this conversation at lunch, I have, I have never seen high phosphorus on the soil get crops in trouble as long as we've got enough sink. If they're not having good phosphorus availability, which I find a little hard to believe with those levels, but that's something that's related to biological activity. Every form of phosphorus before it comes into the plant, you have to ask much your mycorrhizae, fungi, and some other things to break that down. So that's a little confusing to me. I would not recommend adding any more phosphorus. I would think a green manure crop or something like that would stimulate our soil biology and and yeah, you know, let's get it up into the plant. If they're having a, depending upon you know, what kind of crops they're growing. They use for corn. I mean, they do corn and beans and eggs of wheat rotation. Okay, so if they're, if they're having a phosphorus uptake problem, then I would go back and look at their calcium levels. Because like I said earlier, calcium brings everything else in. We see that a lot in potato production, don't we, Jake? Mm -hmm. uh, you bring on soluble calcium to that potato, Crop and immediately the phosphorus levels go up in the plant. What about some of these enzyme products that uh, they're talking about putting down the road to release that early phosphorus for the corn? Any thoughts on that kind of stuff? Is that a band aid that you're buying in a jug because your biology is not right? Um, not necessarily. I think as, as we've gotten the whole industry, as we've gotten more information, we've gotten a little smarter about some of those things and understand how to use them and what they do. We're, we're actually doing a little bit of that. We kind of took a stance for quite a few years. We just kind of stepped back and, and said, let's, let's let it sort itself out a little bit. And now I think there's some merit to some of those. But having said that, I always tell farmers, you know, we all know that there's, there's a lot of, I'm just going to call them biological additives out there. And not that they're all bad by any means, but don't ever lose sight of the basics, the fundamentals, what I was talking about. Soil correction, balanced crop fertilizer, a lot of times you don't need those other things. They're like the frosting on the cake, but you've got to make a cake first, unless you just like frosting. <laughs> Bob, can you talk about some of the different soil tests we use for phosphorus? Whether you there's a particular one you like. I remember back when I worked for you guys, you would like to take both a Bray P1 and a Bray P2. How has that evolved? since I quit working for you. Um, basically, it's still the same. What, <coughs> what he's talking about there is if on your, we use Midwest Laboratories out of Omaha. Um, they've, they've been around, they're one of the largest independent <coughs> testing labs. Um, we're just, we're very familiar with them. All the other labs are fine, we just use it. But on your salt test, you, you always want to get, there's two, they do a mild acid extraction and they have a P1, which is, you know, it's what the lab extracted there, simulating what the roots are supposed, what the root on your plant should be able to get a hold of. So the P1 is your available phosphorus. Then they do a stronger and um, extraction again. That's called the P2. That's supposed to simulate your reserve phosphorus in the soil. And your phosphorus should be cycling from P2 into P1. Plants feed on the P1 side. So the reason you want to get those, you want to look at the relationship, and there should be a, normally a one to two ratio, unless you've got extremely high phosphorus, like we see on some of these manure farms, where like you said, they got 300 pounds, and the P1 might be 300, or parts per million, 150, and the P2 might be 150, or, you know, then it really doesn't matter because you've got so much, but normally you'd want a one to two ratio, so if you're looking at the industry out there, if you have a 25 on P1 and a 50 on P2, that's, that's adequate. That's a, that's a nice place to be. And then if it goes up a little bit from there, that's, you know, that's fine. Other questions? I have a broad question. What are you guys seeing in 
I'm choicey, I mean, blends, mixes, or, I mean, monocultures, what's your, what's your kind of, your favorite your, at this point that you're seeing of, of what you're using for cover, a fall cover crop, blend, any, any ideas yet? Sure. Okay. Is that okay? That's fine. Go to it. Well, at least in our area, you know, typically if you're going to drill in the cover, that we have a lot of guys that still make it a priority. We have really sandy grounds and really heavy clay grounds. So the sandier soils, there's there's an urgency to make sure there's cover on those grounds in our area. So they're using things like cereal rye if they're getting the crop off really late, or things like winter wheat is a very common one that they're using in the area. And we do have quite a bit of annual ryegrass being drilled in. Um, as far as like flying on covers, this year we did the monoculture of annual ryegrass, but the year before we had several growers who did a mix. And they did a mix of the oilseed radish, crimson clover, and annual ryegrass. Um, I, I was really hesitant with that mix. I do like to see the crimson clover and the annual ryegrass because they grow really well in the shaded conditions. But as we know, the oilseed radish is a vegetable and it needs a lot of warmth, warmth to the soil and sunlight to grow. So we did not have you know, the arling tubers that the growers wanted, the tillage portion of the radish that they wanted. I mean, we got a couple inch of growth off these radishes, and so we were, I think we could still get a lot of benefits from that. Um, but I just don't think you're getting your money's worth, depending on what application you're using. If you have wheat in your rotation and you're really curious about the tillage radish, um, that's a good option for you to try the tillage radish then if you really want to use it for the breaking up compaction. Um, otherwise, you know, Right now, because growers are still hesitant in our area using the cover crops, we're really just trying to do one species at a time to get them to get their feet wet with it, so they can manage it and pull it off or burn it off pretty easily. Um, so, but it's going to depend. This year, I'm going to see if any growers are interested in trying, you know, the annual ryegrass and the and the crimson clover mix. The problem is these cover costs have gone up quite a bit. So if you're doing something like a fly-on, it's already going to cost you a little bit more money to do it. So every dollar counts. So that's another reason why we're trying to keep the cost down and, you know, make it so that these growers want to try it. So we are finding good luck with the single crop species, but I think there's so many benefits to a multi-crop cover crop. And if you would meet your rotation, I would encourage to get a couple different varieties in that mix. So you can kind of replicate nature. You know, we used to have prairies and forests, and there's multiple species in those have in those systems. And you know, if we can get back to the, what those soils once had, I think we can see a lot of balancing benefits from using those type of mixes. But there's not a ton of research on that. That's that's just some theories out there. Is that helpful? Yeah, certainly, uh, Colleen and I both went to the National No-Till Conference this year, and certainly there was a lot of talk about the advantages of the, the cocktail mixes, just in terms of the speed of organic matter development and all that. You know, that being said, I, I think there's a hell of a lot to be said for just good old cereal rye. You know, it's so flexible. The benefits of it are, are pretty high, and it dies beautifully with just a sniff of, of glyphosate. So. You know, I, I think it's more important to, to do it than to you know torture yourself worrying about if you're doing exactly the right thing. Introductory, you talk about marijuana being introductory drug. Well, cereal rye is a good introductory cover crop. I think I'll just let that lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling everybody that there's an alternative crop that we should be looking at because we have four dollar corn. And it's growing cover crops for seed. Yeah. Right, because that plus is going up. Yes. So you want to just keep that on your radar if you want to uh, diversify on your farm, and then you'll have your own seed too. Right. If we use so. Yeah. Yeah. Thing I found, or that we found, with looking at cover crops, yes, the more species you can get, I think there's a real benefit in that. The other one is, don't give up on the cover crops. A lot of farms try something, had a bad experience, or it didn't work, and they said, well, I'll never do that again. And we're encouraging everyone.
keep trying it. Uh, in our area, we tell guys, if nothing else, plant some oats. Oats are relatively inexpensive. Your soybeans get off early, go out and drill some oats. Even if they only get this big, the benefits, the soil building benefits from those sugars and everything else. And here's the other one. We did an experiment here a couple years ago, and for time purposes, I didn't put it in there, but I've got some slides on it. We grew some oats in a because we wanted to see what the roots of the plant were doing. So we did it in some plastic tubs and potting soil and we grew some oats. Now that was a controlled environment, but the end result was impressive. After, I don't know, it was like, um, it was only like 25 days, it wasn't that many days of growth, but anyhow, we took the plants out, washed all of the soil and everything off the roots, then separated the roots and the top of the plant and sent it in for separate analysis. And the interesting thing was this, the calcium and magnesium in the roots was four to five times higher than those in the top part of the plant, and so were the trace minerals. So you're recycling those nutrients. See, that's the other thing, if you look at this tillage radish, we've done that, and maybe you guys have a tillage radish, have you sent in the tubers and then the top? Nothing like that, now. Yeah, so we sent those in. Well, if you look in our soils, which we're, we're at in, in Iowa there, um, we're lower potassium soils, we're CECs of 12 to 20, and guys are buying a lot of potassium, but when, when we look at that, uh, you know, it's year after year, application of potassium, there's a lot of potassium in that soil that I say is not cycling. That tillage radish taps into that. Those tubers are over 8% potassium. Wow. So they've taken that potassium from that reserve that doesn't even show up on your salt test. They sucked it up and there's no starch in those. It's all sugar. So that completely breaks down next year and it's giving that potassium back to next year's crop. That's probably gonna be one of, I think we're gonna get more benefit out of that than we are over the um, compaction part. Because I don't know if you've seen this or not. Remember my slide about 300 pounds per square inch? I've seen tillage radish, maybe you have too, yeah. in fields where there's compaction. Well, not only that, what I've seen is they grow down, they hit the compacted layer, and they're so prolific they keep growing. I've seen them grow out of the ground 10, 12 inches. They can't get through the compaction, so they grow up. <laughs> Which is still a good thing, you got all those sugars and everything else, but if the ground is that hard, they can't get through that. It's a start, it's a good thing that they did. They're thinking about it. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point about oats. I think that's a really underutilized cover crop. Uh, one of our producers this past year uh, put in a cover crop of oats prior to planting uh, Roundup Ready beans and then sprayed, uh, sprayed out the oats. and. Aside from some rogue canola that got kind of snuck in there from Canada, we think. I, I think that was a pretty successful experiment we did this past year. You know, and uh, I guess the other thing is, you know, if we, if we can do something like that and kind of push down that free nitrogen content there, how much faster are those beans going to get nodulating? Because legumes are lazy. If they don't have to nodulate, they won't. But if we can kind of force them to nodulate quicker because we've got that biology tying up some of that in. I think that might have some serious advantages. Somebody else had a question here? Um, you talked a little bit about um, molasses or sugar um, in the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Does that come a little bit more on that? <clears throat> what, what are you trying to accomplish or what would it be? Well, what we've, what we've done with that, and I've been working with molasses for over 20 years in the fertilizer industry, and Putting molasses in with conventional fertilizers, 10, 34, 0, 28, 32 percent, a couple things happen. First one is that you soften that whole liquid complex down. So you've taken some of the harshness away. See, our goal should be whether we're putting any dry or liquid fertilizer into the soil, it should be as root acceptable as we can make it. And that's what molasses does. It changes all the properties. But what we found in the last couple of years, now that we're We've got more farmers doing it. When you add the molasses into the liquid nitrogen, molasses is a real high carbon with the sugars, and then there's some natural um, sulfur, there's some other things in there. It immediately latches on to that, that free ammonia that's in there and it shuts it down. I've got some little samples out of my truck, I should have brought them in here. 
but I don't know if you, if you guys that deal with 28 or 32, if you, you smell it, you can smell a little ammonia coming off. You put some molasses in there, it stops it immediately. So we're stabilizing. I have the farmers that are using that, if there are a lot of guys in this corn on corn, they want 10 to 15 gallons of nitrogen sprayed out over the top in their first herbicide pass to get that residue breaking down. They'll put a couple, two, three gallons of molasses in there and they say it just lays that nitrogen down on the stalks. They don't see all that volatilization behind the floater. Well, we've got guys that are um, streaming some on now. That's, that's starting to be a popular thing, especially in no-till. They want to get some nitrogen right there by the rope because we're dealing with these racehorse hybrids and need their nitrogen early. That stabilizes that nitrogen so it's not volatile and it's less leachable when, it, when you get your rains in that. And it's a more natural way of doing it than adding Nutrisphere or Instinct or one of those to lock it up because they're basically, uh, you know, they're a bacteria side. They're stopping the bacteria from coming in and converting the nitrogen. So you're doing it in a more natural way. We're actually stimulating soil biology. What kind of amounts are you looking at? Um, well, we started out, we were a little conservative. We were going at 10% and this last year now we've <coughs> We've raised that up to, so let's say you're going to put on 20 gallons of nitrogen. Uh, you might have three to four gallons of molasses in with that. And then the other thing we're going to have a lot of guys experiment with this year, um, you know, instead of adding that molasses and putting 24 gallons on per acre, they're going to back down and they're going to start to back down in their nitrogen. Their efficiency, they think they're getting better efficiency or we're seeing that. So now we can use a little less nitrogen. Saying they put it in starter too, then? What, do you hmm? mean, what kind of rate is starter? Um, same thing, two, three gallons, something like that. We've, uh, we had a farm last year. This, do we have any organic producers in here? Yeah, we had Mike Bronkema earlier, but I think he's gone. Yeah. We had one organic farm last year. Of our business, about 15, 16 percent of our business is organic farms, so of our fertilizer blends now, we can do some things. Our, our mainstay is conventional land, corn, so it means wheat, alfalfa, and all that. But we had one organic farmer that took 10 gallons of our TerraFed, which is our 104 molasses product, with some fermentation solubles and yeast extracts. We added some more biology to it. And he went out with the cultivator. Actually, his son was doing it. It's kind of an interesting story. It's a father-son operation. 10 gallons of our TerraFed and 10 gallons of water, and they were side dressing on corn. And they got done in about two and a half weeks, three weeks later, dad's looking out where their farm is to be like looking out there. And here's this strip in the field that's not as dark green colored as the rest of it. Now there was no additional nitrogen. This is an organic farm, so they can't buy nitrogen. It was just molasses. And dad says to the son, he goes, what's that strip out there in the field? And son gets kind of humble and he says, I forgot to turn the unit on for a round. I didn't tell you because I didn't think we'd see anything. <laughs> so we tracked it. You know, sometimes our mistakes are our best research. So we, we tracked it, we monitored for the whole year. We got down at the combine at the yield monitor, and it's going up a side hill, clay hill, and they were extremely dry. They went 60 days without a rain. On the top side of the strip, um, we had 17 bushel increase on the bottom side, which was closer to the draw, and there was a little more moisture, 32 bushels. And 10 gallons of the molasses product. So now that really, now everybody's like saying, whoa, wait a minute, we may have missed something on these sugars and, and the ability, you know. So we got a lot of guys going to be doing experiments with that this year. So. Would it have to be molasses, or could you just add regular sugar? You could add, he's asking sugar versus molasses. You're seeing a lot of things in the farm magazines, guys are doing sugar. The reason we prefer molasses over sugar, and if molasses wasn't available, I would take some sugar. Molasses went through a fermentation process. So if you look at the complete analysis, it's a nutrient package in itself with everything that's in it. It's got some B vitamins, it's got some biology in it. You know, on the feed side, they call it unidentified growth factors when you feed it to cows and when it does it in the rumen. We're getting some of those same properties in the soil. So we're, and molasses, when you compare it to straight sugar for just ease of handling and some other things, but it's very economically priced in comparison to sugar because, you know, not that it's a big deal. Some of you guys might be using sugar, but you still got to put sugar in the solution, don't you? Molasses is already in solution. You just turn it off, pump it in, and away with it. 
Does molasses mix good with 28? Don't get a gum off your nose? Yeah. What we've done is the company, we're working with, with quality liquid feeds. Is anybody familiar with them? They're the molasses people out of Dodgeville. And their expertise on the feed side, our expertise on the agronomy side, this was a natural marriage, so to speak. And we've done the formulations. They do the, do the manufacturing for us. And it's, it's, it's manufactured. It's screened. We learned it's screened at 50 mesh going into the truck. They dedicate certain trucks so we don't have any cross-contamination. It's screened at 50 mesh coming out. First year we had some little issues and we thought, well, this is screening. So it's kind of like the moron approach. You know, it's not working. So 50, 40 mesh wasn't working. We went to 50 and the guy said, well, that's not working. So they put in a 60. The smaller the screen got, we started to precipitate the sugars out. We made it worse. Guys, you put up to 80 mesh and call them and say, this is, this is getting worse. What's going on here? Then they got their chemist involved, and now we've got our quality control down. It's a nice product, and it flows nice, handles nice, and everything else. It's just not straight molasses. They're taking the raw cane and manufacturing products for us. I got some samples of it right here on the table. You can certainly take a look at it. The other nice and completely different subject, but we open those little bottles and it leaks around the top, you know, a little bit when you go to put it on. So we're at the farm show there last week and I picked the sample up to show it to a guy and I got some on my finger and I was telling him, I said, this is our new liquid starter here. We just formulated, well not new, it's three years old, but new to him. And I said, uh, and I had some on my finger and I just licked it off and he looked at me and I said, you, you can't do that with many other commercial fertilizers, can you? <laughs> This is a probably a dumb question. People are going to look at me like I'm stupid, but um, with the advent of irrigation, I mean, Michigan is a very irrigation-rich state. How does that affect, or does it affect, soil health and microbial activity? And um, I guess how does it fit in with carbon crops as well? Is there any is there any damage that could be done from irrigation on soil health? <laughs> um, here's on any crop, here's a couple things that we have to look at with irrigation. Irrigation water is different than rainwater. We all know that. Rainwater is actually soft water. It's most of it's um, ocean or salt water that it has evaporated, got back up into our atmosphere. So it's totally different. The things we have to watch with irrigation are the mineral contents, and Jake, you guys have had some, you can probably, you might want to add something to this when I'm done here, but you have to watch some minerals that are in there, whether it's iron, some of them have a lot of calcium and magnesium, the hardness of, you see these uh, pivots out there, and they're getting certain areas, and they're completely orange from all the iron. Iron ties up phosphorus in your soils. So you have to be concerned about the mineral content and how much water you're pumping and what potentially can that do to the mineral tie up in your soils. The other thing that we found over the years, especially when we get into certain areas, if you're pumping irrigation water and it's not, you're not getting good infiltration because of those minerals and that, some gypsum is an excellent amendment to help get better water infiltration. You'll get more efficiency out of your water. Any comments on that? I would just agree with it. I mean, we see hard water, that's for sure, um, and that can have an impact, but that's where we pay so much attention to calcium in those situations. Yeah. Well, and certainly if that's the water you spray with also, boy, you really got to know the mineral content of that, especially calcium and iron, because it'll tie uh, glyphosate up just wonderfully. And we actually had a, another good presentation on that at the National No-Till Conference. It's not just about pH, it's about hardness. And you may have to do some fairly extensive water conditioning. If you've really got a lot of iron and calcium, you, you want to start thinking about that before you're headed to the field. As far as the cover crops go, the growers that flew on the cover crop really liked having irrigation because they just put a couple rounds in of water to make sure that it because actually it took about four weeks before we got rain after we flew on our cover so people were nervous about it so they ran the irrigator just to get some some of that started the germination started on those seeds so but i mean we had a great stand 
anyway, so most of it went onto dry land. Only a couple fields were irrigated. But I think I think they like it for that reason. If they want to have cover crops in their system, they can make sure they're going to get water because that can be one of the germination problems in the fall. Um, speaking of uh, covers, um, given the the timing issue of getting a entire field seeded after harvest before snow falls, um, I'm wondering if you've had a whole lot of feedback regarding. Um, Buffer cropping or trap cropping is kind of a compromise, you know, just getting a couple strips here and there versus in entire fields, uh, even perennials or successes, failures, anything. Um, I haven't had too many takers on that. Um, we are promoting like buffer zones and filter strips along water bodies, and sure. it uses similar mixes, and we see better infiltration on those areas, but as far as, you know, I don't I don't have people really breaking up their fields to do like experimental sure. stuff. They'll just kind of also we have really small fields. Our average field size is, is like 40 acres in our county. And so 40, 50 acres. So I mean I think they'll commit fully <coughs> to covering the whole the whole field. But <laughs> it, it would be interesting to talk them into some of that. And we don't have I don't have tons of guys like calling me about experimenting with sure. these. They either like want to try it on a couple fields, or mm -hmm. or they don't want to. Usually, the hedgerow between fields is probably enough. Yeah, you know, it's just it, not much where we are. <laughs> Well, this may be unrelated to what you're asking, but there actually has been some interesting work the last few years on on living mulch systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Ken Albrecht out of the University of Wisconsin did some work with Cura Clover that looked very promising. I mean, basically, it eliminated your nitrogen budget and didn't seem to impact yield at all. And I know Iowa did some trials a couple of years ago where they, they trialed a whole bunch of different uh, cover crops. And what was surprising to me is the most successful one turned out to be Kentucky bluegrass, which you know boggled my mind for a while. But if you think about it, what's Kentucky bluegrass do? It grows like crazy in the spring, and then it just kind of goes dormant through most of corn's growing season. So in retrospect, that kind of made some sense about why that might work. So I, I think there'll be some more interest in those systems, but it, it's, you know, for, for a population that's hard to talk into no-till, yeah. talking them into having a field full of weeds to plant in that they didn't go in and kill, that might be a bridge too far for a lot of people. Interesting side note on that, not really with cover crops, but I would say farmers are innovators. So in Northwest Illinois, uh, if you get down through that area, there's a certain amount, and I don't know how many of them, but with this whole rootworm and rootworm beetle thing, and now they want them to spray an insecticide, you know, and the guys are just they're looking at that and saying, you know, when's this all going to stop? Well, how many in here grow pumpkins or squash? Anybody? So what's your biggest predator on pumpkins and squash? Uh, usually beetles. It's actually in that family, but yeah. the rootworm beetles are attracted to, the, to those plants. So what those farmers are doing strategically in the middle of their large corn acres, they're putting in maybe an acre of pumpkins or an acre of squash. Not really for anything. They might they might sell a few, but then the beetles are all coming to that, and then they're spraying that. So instead of spraying the whole field, they're spraying that. So that's integrated pest management. Yeah. I mean, it really it makes sense. You guys said, why would I spray that whole field? If I can attract the bugs to come out here, and I'll just spray them on one or two acres instead of spraying the 100 acres. Yeah. Makes sense. Sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah. you know. That's good revenue. Yeah, and they got some pumpkins to sell. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I was thinking outside the box. There you go. Yep. Other questions? <laughs> One more for Bruce. There we go. I had the observation when you were giving your planter presentation, and I talked to Colin a little bit about this. You said the, the row cleaner, you know, clean, clean the row. On one of your pictures, it showed the row cleaner, showed the row, and the corn was coming up, and it was actually crusted um, where the row cleaners had cleaned the row. Um, and I read an article that maybe we don't want to clean the row in. Entirely because you take away that uh, 
cover over that soil. And I just, it, it was just an interesting picture. I yeah, up on that little thing in my mind too. That little tidbit on that. I know it's a small thing, but you know, <coughs> crusting could be a problem when you're moving that residue that's closer to the soil. No doubt about it. Um, I would say nine times out of ten, though, you're going to win. Takes the right weather event to create that after the plant. Sure, think of that. Yeah. And can you pick different row cleaners that would maybe not move the residue as far, or you know, if you just want like a couple inch openings? Mm -hmm. Well, the row cleaner, you have to make sure it's always wide enough to clear your gauge wheels. Anytime you don't clear a path wide enough to clear your gauge wheels, you're basically you're yeah, you're basically just hurting yourself more than you are gaining you got to make sure you move all the trash away from that most of the right. Are those road cleaners dependent on speed? What was that? I said, are those road cleaners dependent on, on speed to kind of keep things cleaned up? Or if you're talking about seven, eight mile an hour, our transplanters are running at about a third of a mile an hour at the nursery. Yeah, you're basically relying on soil to help push those spikes up and around again. You get down to it's going to take some really fluffy soil and real slow speed to get that little cleaner to stop. It's just just like your seat opener disc or anything like that. It's relying on the forward momentum to keep pulling things around. Just another comment on that. We look at these planters and we look at this technology is phenomenal. It just amazes me. Just the things that precision time is introducing in that. And Jake and I were standing there talking. I said, how many engineers are there every day thinking that stuff up? You know, it's just, it just amazes me. But if you go back to just the basics of a corn planter, you know, and I always tell the farmers this, when, when it comes to soil conditions and planting, <coughs> any soil condition less than ideal is unacceptable. So if every farmer waited for that, we wouldn't need all these attachments on these planters or anything else because the soil conditions would be ideal. But now let's get back to the real world. How often does that happen? Well, if they can plan nine, ten mile an hour. <laughs> so that's why we have all these different things that we put on planters because we're in conditions less than ideal. Now, it would be, wouldn't it be so nice? It would be so nice if we didn't have to depend on all that, but. And then we got more acres to cover, we got bigger planters, we got to get it done, you know, and the list just and it compounds on itself. Just to piggyback on what Bob said, and I started with precision planning six years ago. They started in the shop, one double size of this room, they had two engineers. Last time I was down for training, they had 55 engineers on staff. Wow. Developing and working on different products. That's a lot of crushed up paper thrown at the little basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Brent, you had talked about how we need to uh, start thinking about narrowing up rows if we're going to push populations higher than 30, 40,000. <clears> Can we effectively clean a 15 inch row next to another 15 inch row? Is there kind of an effective floor maybe for no-till planting of say 20 inches? I mean, is that, is that where the compromise is going to be? 20 inch row corn, 20 inch bean rows, not too bad, canopies well, but no white mold. I mean, is that kind of where we're going to end up, you think? Yeah, we're running into that, especially especially with um, planters with lead rolls, they call them. Kenzie's or Deers have a setback of lead roll. And if you're trying to run a roll cleaner on both the front and the back, they're throwing loose trash in the back roll a little bit out of that front roll. It is going to be a problem, no doubt about it. We have, I have, engineers are probably are trying to figure out a way to keep that trash closer to the roll, no doubt about it. It's going to be a problem. It's, it's going to cause bacterial problems in that seed bed for the row that gets it all thrown back on it. So. Are, you, are you seeing that at 20s or is that more at 15s? <clears throat> we only really, in West Michigan, we only have one farm up towards Fremont that's planted in 15s. Mm -hmm. um, we have, this year I know of one guy experimenting with 20 inch rows. And we have one farmer in West Michigan that started to experiment with twin rows last year. So to know where it's all going to go, um, you go down to the <coughs> Illinois area on the thick black sands of precision planting, all those guys are 20 inch rows. Uh, 20 inch rows is a totally different manage management strategy 
than what we're used to around here. It requires new heads, new tires, everything set up differently. Twin rows, we found last year we could still side dress in our normal 30 inch toolbars. So, where it's going to land, I don't know. How it, the strategy of resident management is going to be big. Down there, they're applying nitrogen the second the combine's on the field. They're putting ammonium sulfate 28 down to help that decaying process to get it going. Because they know they have to break down as much of that trash as they can. And they have the advantage of being warmer into the fall than what we do to make that work better too. What do you guys think of vertical tillage? Nothing new or revolutionary? Something in between? Have to be careful with it. I think it's great for um, guys going to beans to break that crust and then plant beans into it. Um, we don't know enough about it yet, I don't think, and how the, what, <coughs> the soil profile underneath that top couple of inches. I mean, it's high speed disc in a way. Mm -hmm. We don't have a ton of guys using it in our area. It's an expensive piece of equipment. I do have some growers interested in trying it just because they want to reduce their tillage and they think it's a it's a better alternative to jumping both feet in with no-till. So they, we may see a little bit more of it. <coughs> I had one grower who did it for two years and he sold it. And that was on really heavy clay ground. Yeah. He didn't he was getting more compaction issues he thought with it. So I don't have enough growers using it to, to know if it's a good solution in our area. It's still tillage though. Some people think it's not. I think part of it is we don't want to manage it ourselves because every vertical tillage tool company tells you something a little bit differently. And until they get uniform and get their stories all collaborated and then we understand how to use the tillage tools better, it's going to be a process of playing with, playing with fire almost. They've made a, a real, I guess, an impact or the market share, the vertical tillage tool, and there's four or five different companies making those. And part of it is because of less tillage, no till. And then it's also this heavy residue. What are we going to do with this residue? And then we got this GMO corn residue that's not breaking down. So it's a combination of all of those things. I agree on what you said about potential compaction. The concept, the theory is right. It's like any other piece of, of, of tillage equipment. As long as it's set properly and we're running it properly, uh, the concept is great because you're breaking the residue into small pieces. But the biggest thing is you should be moving one to two inches. You're actually bringing some soil up and mixing it with the residue. So you're inoculating the soil or the residue with soil biology. That's the start of the decomposition. You know, I was in a um, uh, this was years back and the guy was no tilling corn on corn and he said and I said what do you think about all these corn stalks standing up out here and he said well my earthworms are going to pull those back down into the soil somebody at a conference told him that and I said unless your uh, earthworms are on an extreme weightlifting program they're going to have trouble pulling those standing corn stalks back down into the soil I still like the fact that Maybe we need to get that residue at least down on the soil, but if we're sacrificing our soil structure or potential compaction, like you just said, then we're not running that tool property. We've got some farms we work with that are very successful, very happy with their vertical tillage tools. Mm -hmm. So that leads me into another question. You know, talking about residue management, with the advent of these new chopping heads, is <clears throat> is that a, a good way? Should farms be looking at using the chopping head as a way to um, help the residue management by chopping not only stock, but like you said, giving it more soil contact by putting it down onto the, the field? And is there any, I mean, are the planters responding different to the different types of heads or anything like that, I guess? You know, in the true no-till situation, if you're planting into that, you're going to be busted down the middle of those corn rows that you had last year. And it's just a matter of uh, moving a little bit more fine trash. <coughs> but what I've seen personally is those, those corn heads do a fantastic job of breaking that residue down and starting the decaying process better than a standard standard. 
I, don't, I can't give you a percentage of, okay, this one's decomposing at 20% faster, 10% faster, with just visual stuff that I see in the end of the times. So it goes back to the base of what I say, no matter what our farming operation, see, to me, no-till is a way of planting, it's not a way of farming. That makes sense to everybody? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll step on some toes here. <laughs> That's why we got steel in our boots. You That's go ahead. Okay. It is. Stop and think about it. Because as a farmer, you have, I give you those jobs up there. But your jobs, no matter what type of tillage operation you're in, is to manage air and water, manage crop residue decomposition, and stop erosion on your farm. So if, you, if you're doing all those with your, you know, the, oper the tillage operation that you have, and you're managing those three and doing a good job at it, then it really doesn't matter what you're doing, does it? See, that's the way to look at it. So what we call no-till, I've seen too many farms that struggled with no-till, and there's, but no, for no-till to work, we have to have really good soil biology, and we have to have good earthworm activity, and, and the industry's aware of that. But if you don't have those and you're no-tilling, you know, potentially it's called failure. And some guys bail yeah. out, you know, just because of that. But see, they didn't understand the whole system. <coughs> they didn't change their fertilizer practices. You know, they had that nutri nutrient stratification, they call it, and broadcasting commercial fertilizers up on top. So the whole, the whole thing goes into that. But just to say, well, everybody's got a no-till, um, yeah, it's a way of planting. And I'm not opposed to that. Because Managing air and water, crop residue decomposition, and stopping erosion. As long as you do those three, it doesn't matter what kind of tillage you do. Yeah, I guess we, it, what I like to say is I want to get my guys to the point where tillage is not the default answer to every, every problem. Yes. You know, I can't get a seed in the ground, the answer must be more tillage. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that I think is one of the ways we've gone wrong sometimes. We, we, we look to it to solve problems when actually we're just creating different problems. Somebody else had a question? I was just going to comment on the fact that when you're talking about uh, chopping heads on court, two years ago my son went to uh, chop her head. Um, and what a huge difference that made. Um, we were interested in trying to uh, bail some uh, corn stalks, and if you didn't, just the last uh, few years, when he would go combine a field, if you didn't get there immediately before it rained, I mean, if you had any rain, that mash on the bottom was already decomposing, and you could, it didn't, you wouldn't want to break it back up. Wow. So it makes a huge difference whether you can chop them stalks up and get it down on the ground. I wonder if we're going to see some problems with with the tillage operations with those. Um, I have one grower and he, he uses one of those heads and there's no residue left in the field. He goes and chisel plows afterwards and I don't, and he does a lot of silage too, like he rotates green corn and silage, so he's just not putting a lot of that residue, that carbon, back into the system. So I'm, I'm wondering if it, you know, it's breaking down so quick and then he goes and opens up the soil and then you're losing it to the atmosphere. So I'm wondering, you know, depending on your system, if, it, if it's better for like a no-till system versus a conventional system, I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, they're happy with it because they want a really clean seedbed in the spring. So that's why they went with it. I do worry a little bit about that in fields prone to flooding. I like to see a lot of corn stalks standing up in a field like that, so if that sucker floods, all that residue doesn't end up on whatever the downwind side of the field is. Or if you've got those standing stalks, at least it'll slow that down. That way you won't get a nasty call from Joe about how there's 16 feet of residue in some ditch that he's got to manage. And it, yeah, we certainly have heard that heard of that happening in, in places that flood. So you might want to look at where your field is before you decide to chop all that residue into tiny little bits. Just to comment on that part that you just described, they have an excellent, hopefully they're doing it, they have an excellent opportunity for cover crops because they're chopping corn. Right. See, for them, that if they didn't change anything else in their operation but just put cover crops on that silage ground and they chop, 
they're, they're going to yeah, they'll yep. change their farm that tremendously window. because now they've just created a window to put cover even, even oats. They can just go out there and put oats in. And if they're chopping corn, I'm assuming then they've got livestock, so they got manure. Yep. So yep. What, what better way to have cover crops with manure? It's perfect. Yeah. And we see a lot of people double, double cropping winter rye on that also. You know, it's cover crop, but then a lot of that will get taken the next year for their dry cow feed or for, for another source of feed. And all you need is, you know, shorten up your corn length by, you know, 15, 20 days, which sounds kind of extreme, but for silage, I don't think it's that big a deal. One more question, I guess. Could you go a little bit more as far as we have a lot of animals, I have a lot of manure, and all that fits in with the no-till situation? Bruce? No thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Dry pack or liquid? Um, yes. Yeah. So it's slurry and, and solid. But... How are you applying the liquid now? Situation now, that's kind of a well, they are, and one of it is you want to maintain or save as many of the nutrients as you can out of the manure. So, spreading on top, yeah, you know, if you can work it in, see, there'd be another that's a great place for a vertical tilling stool. Spread the manure and hit it with that vertical tilling stool, and you're just fluffing everything up and mixing it. They call that sheet composting. So, you took high carbon. From your corn stalk, if it's if it's going on corn stalk residue, and then you took the high nitrogen and you just mix those two together. That's an excellent place. Or your disking is fine. What you're doing, but yeah, it's in a no-till situation. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a trade-off because you want to get the good out of your manure. You also got to be environmentally friendly here. To you know, you got volatilization and some of those things. You probably need to work in a little bit. So you may never get to it true no-till situation. I don't know, does anybody else have thoughts on that? So going to that no-till conference, we talked with some growers about using manure in their system. Um, and what we see that they're doing is they'll go in and plant their cover crops. Well, this is cover crops in their system. And then after the cover crops established, go in and spread manure on top of that. And that way it's actually going into a live plant. And that seems to work well for at least dairy liquid. Um, hog manure is a little bit hard, harder to do with cover crops, but um, talking to Bruce last week, we worked with the big dairy in Van Buren, and you know one of the things that this dairy owner told me, he's like, well, you know, I have this permit with DEQ, the NBDES permit, and I have to incorporate my manure within 24 hours, so I really can't do a no-till system. Mm -hmm. um, but I talked to Bruce, and he's like, there's a couple, um, I guess. Um, loopholes around that in the sense that if you do have a no-till system, you can get away with broadcasting on top. I think you have to use a lower rate or soil sample before to make sure the rate's right. Um, but I think he hit the nail on the head. If we get a heavy rain or whatever, you're going to lose a lot of those nutrients. So adding something like a cover crop to help kind of take that in a little bit quicker may help. But that's a whole other set of management and another pass in the field and things like that. So. Um, there are growers around the, the country doing it. I've heard them talk about it. Um, not much in our area yet. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, being courteous to the neighbors, you know, with the smell and certain things like that. So, or having just crusaders try it, you know, and see if it does work for their system. Seems like it'd get quite anaerobic sitting on the top and on the crust too. Yeah. You know, we, have, we have one farm that we work with and it's a, it's a large hog operation. It's 22,000 sows. Oh, that's a little bit. Far. That's that's a few. Um, and and he doesn't. He can't raise all of his own crop, but he has 3,000 acres of corn. And it's some it's some rolling grounds. So now he's got some flat ground. Some of it is some rolling hills. But he goes in and he's actually well. He's not really injecting. He's, he's I would call it. He's mildly incorporating the liquid hog manure. Then he goes and he spreads rye on top of that, 
with a little palletized gypsum or maybe just a little ammonium sulfate to get it sulfur. Then he hits it with his vertical tillage tool and levels everything up. Then he comes back in in the spring with his zone machine and he just clears a little path and makes a little zone and he puts just a little bit of nitrogen down there. He doesn't, we're slowly backing him down on nitrogen, but he still thinks he, he's probably, I still think he's using more than he should be, but he's grown some fantastic yields. And then the corn goes right back in there and then that's just repeated. It's corn on corn every year on 3,000 acres doing a phenomenal job and it's it's uh, he's, you know the neighbors that are asking him now there we started working with him four years ago and you know he was the last guy I would have thought ever did cover crops and he did it on we talked him into 100 acres one year and he said that was the best soil that was the best for planting he just he sprays the rye off in the spring you know just kills it comes in and plants he does it on every acre now is he using annual rye or cereal rye cereal rye cereal rye one thing you may want to look at is uh, separating the liquids and the solids. Uh, if you have a center pivot irrigation, then you can turn around and irrigate the liquids out on growing crops. Now, you probably don't want to do that on a day when it's 95 degrees and the wind's blowing toward town, but at least then you're putting that liquid fraction high in uh, nitrogen and potassium on a growing crop at a time when that crop can use it very quickly. Then you can handle the solid fraction separately that's going to be higher in phosphorus so you can more accurately target it to fields that need the phosphorus plus since it's a solid it's not as likely to, to move and run so you might be a little more flexible about what kind of slope you can put it on so I, I think there's a number of ways to, to crack this thing and there certainly are lower disturbance injectors um, out there that I'm starting to run into more rolling injectors and uh, in doing some research on this, there's a lot more of this going on in Europe. Uh, the Danes especially have some, some rolling injecting systems where they're even injecting into uh, forage fields and not doing too terrible much damage. So I, I think it's possible, but it definitely takes some, some thinking and maybe some more management. Kind of a theme today, more thinking and more management. I have a, a swine operation that is, is completely no-till, and one of the issues they're running into is that the nutrients are staying in that top portion of the soil profile and potentially not being utilized to the maximum. And maybe what you said earlier is, is manure no-till may be a little more tricky, but is there a way to move that down without actually disturbing the soil through a cover crop, or is it just one of those things that maybe doesn't go hand in hand completely. I would like to believe that the cover crops help, but I don't know how much research we have on that, but that's the theory, that if you use a cover crop, it will help translocate those nutrients down to like the, the deeper root systems. Is that liquid hog manure? Yes. Is it, is it corn on corn? Rotating through. Uh, I think he rotates. I don't know for sure, but I think he rotates corn and soybeans. Um, it's a little puzzling why, because as soluble as that as liquid hog manure is and those nutrients that they they should be moving in that situation there. Now we're gonna I'm gonna throw another piece of tillage tool out here. How many are familiar with an airway machine? You know they are, All right? See if if that's actually what's going on, that's called that. Nutrient stratification, Don Schrieffer talks about that in his book. I'd run an airway over that. You can still no-till and everything. Airway is, if you're not familiar with one, think of a think of a shaft with points on it like this. So as it rolls through the ground, you can set the gang at an angle, you can get pretty aggressive, you can just run it straight. But as that rolls into the ground, then it lifts and aerates and comes back out, but it just basically it pokes holes in the ground. They're about that wide, or about this wide, and about that long. And that kind of opens and shatters, lets water that will take those nutrients down in. That's what I'd recommend for him. Not an airway over that. But then you can go right in and still no till. Before or after manure? No, I'm. Air, well, airway before or after or the water. Yeah, or, yeah, I'll do it before yeah. and then manure will go down in there. If he's already got to do it, he can do it right now in the spring. The other thing that they found with the airway and no till situations is the soil warming in the spring. You run an airway in the fall and in the spring that soil is going to be five to seven degrees warmer. Would that be better in strip tilling or? Um, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of 
without knowing the whole situation here and how tight his soils are, if, if, if those nutrients aren't moving, I'm tending to think without going to that field with a spade that, that we don't have good soil tilt and structure. He's got like a, a crust on there, maybe the airway would break that up. But with any of this, you've always got to get in the field with a spade and, and you got to do some digging. You know, we're just, we're hypothetical here. But. Other questions? If, if it is compacted, what deep ripping help? Well, yeah, if it's compacted, then you would want to go in there and do some deep ripping. But um, uh, some of you, like I think we talked to, you're doing some deep ripping. Yeah, we do that every other year. I just yeah. Like it, you know. yeah. See, and, and ideally, if we're doing some deep ripping, or you know, then I want to be out there with my penetrometer and find out where my compacted layer is because if it's at 12 or 13 inches, there's no reason to be going 16 inches. And the ones that I like would be, you know, the, the shank that's going through and you're just going through and you're lifting and aerating, but you're doing minimal soil disturbance. You know, I have this guy. Yeah, well, or even like a blue jet or there's some other ones out there. I say, to me, a, a subsoiler that's, that's running ideally, set perfectly, running in the field, your neighbor should be driving by and saying, what's that crazy guy doing out there because we can't see anything. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like he did anything. That's a properly set subsoil. If it looks like he chisel plowed it, no, that's not right. And I think subsoiling the conditions have to be right. I mean, you can do an right. awful lot of damage if you're out there when you shouldn't be. You gotta do it in the fall when it's dry. You gotta do it in the fall when it's dry. I, I really think it should follow wheat. Yeah, I think it should follow wheat ideally myself. And if you're, you know, for whatever reason, you know, once again, if it's working, you know, I can't sit here and tell you that you don't need to do that. If it's not broke, don't be trying to fix it. But I would be looking at calcium and sulfur because if we're going in and restructuring our soils every other year, and maybe we need to do that depending upon the type of soil, I'd be wanting to add some calcium and sulfur to help with that, and maybe I'd be down subsoiling every three years or because I had a wet fall or a wet spring or something like that. Well, the year, the year we did do it, we got two more tractor broke down, and then it got wet. We had about a 50 bushel less corn. Oh, wow. That's yes. the next year. Yeah. That's how tight the soils are. Wow, they're tight. Just ask Joe here, he know. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd want to see some soil samples on that and see where some gypsum fit in. If they're that tight, gypsum might be that might really help me on those type of soils. Anybody else? See, look at that. We had a whole hour's worth of questions. That was pretty good. <laughs> I'd like to thank our panelists today. Thanks for coming, doing double duty. Very much. <laughs>